few articles. Like uh, even before he started, maybe one week pa lang or something, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, um, all these news have been attacking him, depicting him, depicting him in a very negative and grim and dark uh, perspective. Right. They as if uh, are trying to insinuate that the new president is dictatorial, uh, violator of human rights. Focusing on that, uh, what is your analysis of this? How come we in the Philippines don't see it that way? How come this Western... Oh, that, that guy is from Business Mirror. <laughs> Good newspaper. Thank you. Uh, what is your take about this? Uh, you're a veteran uh, broadcast journalist and, a, and an analyst of media. What, why is the Western media, especially American media, so negative? Is there a sinister plot or is there a, a disconnect psychologically? What is the problem and why do people in the Philippines, most of the, us, think highly of the president and his efforts, courageous and daring? And how come these Western media reports, even before he started, ruling the country one of the weeks only all these negative reports about him can you comment right. thank, you. thank you Wilson well, that's, a, that's really a good starting point uh, for today's discussion uh, and, and let's start out basically with, with my stay for example uh, working for, for the Global Times which is by the way the official Communist Party newspaper of China so so that's how influential it is and, I, and I'm a senior editor there and and many Chinese and, and even my, my fellow expats ask me, uh, David, uh, who's this new president of yours? Uh, why is he talking that way? Why is he acting this way, this and that way? Uh, and, and that's a starting point of this discussion because the battle here, the way I see it, the battle uh, for, for President Duterte, or, or for any president for that matter, but I think especially for President Duterte, uh, is a battle of perceptions. It's really a battle, it comes down to a battle of perceptions. All right? uh, never mind the reality. The reality almost doesn't count. What matters here is a battle of perceptions. And in the battle of perceptions right now, because, precisely because uh, President Duterte is something of an enigma to to most, if not all, foreigners, especially to Americans. Uh, people, foreigners especially, I think, do not understand where Duterte is coming from. All right. Now, let's 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 backtrack a bit and go to the beginning. Let's go to the beginning when when he first took office. And he first made this, these pronouncements, and the first news of killings were reported. At that time, at that time, I think, uh, just, just to be perfectly honest and candid, at that time, uh, his communication team should have come out very strong already I told you, it's a, it's a battle of perceptions. It's a battle of narratives. It's a battle of narratives. You have to win the narrative war. So his communication team should have come out very strong that time and said, look here, we understand, we understand that there are allegations, that there are a number of people, a few people, who have been caught in the crossfire and are innocent, who have been killed, and are allegedly innocent of this so-called drug war. Innocent victims, all right? We understand that and we commiserate with the families who have been affected by this. And that is why President Duterte has ordered an immediate investigation into these isolated incidents. That is why we have ordered the Department of Social Welfare and other departments to visit the families of these so-called innocent victims to provide them with support 
and to provide them with all forms of aid we can. And we will also investigate those who may be unnecessarily riding, piggybacking off this campaign. In other words, who are not authorized, who are not authorized to be part of this campaign, and we will crack down on those people who are just piggybacking on this campaign because we do not authorize whatever they are doing. That way, you see, right away, when you come out strongly, when the communication team comes out strong this way, with its own narrative, suddenly you shift the narrative around. Now the media starts asking questions. We didn't think of it this way. Bang! You change the narrative. Let me give you an example. In the United States, for example, Donald Trump had a very bad reputation. Donald Trump had a very bad reputation. And his numbers were going down for a while. So what did he do? He got rid of his entire campaign team, and he changed it with a completely new one, right? Suddenly, his narrative is changing. Suddenly, he jumps the gun on Hillary Clinton, and he accepts the invitation of Nieto, of Mexican President Nieto, Peña Nieto, and he steals the limelight from Hillary Clinton, and suddenly the narrative all of a sudden changes. Suddenly again, he is front and center, Clinton is in the sideline again, and suddenly if you look at the latest polls of CNN, ORC, Fox News, and the other surveys, suddenly Trump is clawing back his way against Clinton. Just like that. Despite all the criticism against Trump, Despite people said calling him a psychopath, despite all the vitriol against Donald Trump, he's back in the game. Just like that because his new communication team turned around the narrative just like that. And that's exactly, I told you from the very beginning, what this thing is all about. It's about narrative. And to continue with this criticism against President Duterte about the, 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 the drug war, continue this discussion. Again, what the Duterte side should be doing is precisely discussing context, the context of this drug war. Context, it's all about context. But you must do these things almost on the fly. You must know instantly, you must come out strong, make a big splash, change the narrative, don't waste any time, and you must make it strong, convincing, and intelligent. What is one way, for example, to bring this whole drug war in perspective? You discuss precisely what has been happening in the Philippines. And one perfect example of how serious the drug uh, situ uh, issue is in the Philippines is that one of Mexico's biggest drug cartel, the Sinaloa drug cartel, has already entered the Philippines has made the Philippines a transshipment point and has made the Philippines a manufacturing base of drugs. That, if you come out with that narrative, people will better understand the context, the seriousness of why President Duterte is so hot on fighting the drug menace in the Philippines. You have to make people understand. You have to emphasize certain things which make sense which precisely justify what he is doing. That you, can't, you cannot do the same old business as usual things in the Philippines. You have to do things, what they call uh, philosophically as necessary evils, not necessarily taken literally, but necessary evils because the situation has become urgent. And precisely when you create a narrative Showing that urgency, people will begin to understand, oh, oh nah, he has to do it. What is the name of this? Uh, can you elaborate on that uh, drug cartel? Uh, Sinaloa drug cartel is one of the biggest worldwide drug cartels. Uh, yes. How do you spell it's, the name again? Uh, Sinaloa. S-I-N-A-L-O-A. Sinaloa. Drug cartel. N-A-L-O-A. Sinaloa. There's another question. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, in continuing uh, your discussion, someone asked me before the start of the forum to ask also, uh, can you 
this guy because you know media more than most people, uh, you work with foreign media. What is the mentality of these foreign media people writing right. about us? Can you help us understand? I, I will make you understand that. Thank yes. you very much. Because, um, because many of us in the local media or in the local right. population, we are astounded and sometimes right. disgusted. How come these Western media reports depict us as very green and negative? Right. Okay, no. you, you have to understand. You have to understand that many, for example, especially the American media, and we've seen most of the criticism yes. coming from the U.S. media: Time Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, etc., etc. Sure, this is American media, okay? But these are big players, okay? You must understand where they're coming from. Again, the Americans. The Americans, and even though I sound like an American, by the way, in Beijing, in Beijing, by the way, they think I'm an American, okay? In Beijing, they think, oh, very good, eh? When I say, eh, oh, you're Canadian, eh? No, I'm not Canadian, eh? Okay, there's a Canadian right there, back there. Right? Uh, you know, but no, no, seriously, they really think I'm an American, okay? Seriously. And that's fine, and that's cool, it's a good cover. It's a good cover for me, it's really a good cover, okay? Uh, but the, the, the thing with these Americans is, they apply their standards or their understanding of certain concepts. What's one of these concepts? Human rights. They apply their definition of human rights. They don't care about other countries' definition. Okay? Their definition. And they're imposing their understanding or their concept of democracy, their concept of human rights, and other things on other countries, basically. They're just imposing. That's all they're doing. They, are, they don't really understand the local conditions. They don't understand, all right? Because basically these American journalists are two kinds of journalists. One, you have the armchair journalists. Those who just sit back and relax in their office in New York City or wherever and do an analysis based on what they read on the internet and everywhere else. Analysis. Armchair analysis. The other type of journalist in the U.S. is what I call the helicopter journalist, what Filipinos know as a parachute journalist, okay? But the international term is helicopter journalist because it describes better what, more or less, symbolically what they do. A helicopter journalist, they see it from this wide angle, report, and take off again and leave. That's why helicopter journalist. The problem with using the term parachute journalist, parachute, you land, you get caught, you're dead, okay? So that's why... <laughs> Helicopter journalist is probably more appropriate, okay? You know, you know, you're nowhere to go if you parachute, right? How about Hilton? Hilton? Hilton journalist. Hilton. 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 They don't normally stay at the Hilton, right? Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Or uh, uh, Hyatt. <laughs> well, 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 of course, Poppy, we're not referring to the Hyatt then. That, that, that's a totally different story. Okay? So then, uh, Shangri-La. That, that's a totally Shangri different story. But again, okay, those are the two general types of journalists of the American. So if I may continue now with this discussion which Wilson brought up about human rights. Even what are the two types? Helicopter, helicopter journalists and armchair journalists. Armchair journalists. Lying there just at home. They're just writing and you know, analyzing based on what they read and that's it. You know what I mean? Armchair journalists, okay? Starks. Yeah. One of these armchair journalists, I know this, is Mr. Rishi Iyengar of Time Magazine. Who, made, who wrote one of the most stinging articles against Duterte. He turns, I did, I did some research about this guy, all right? He's an online journalist. That's why people were saying in, on Facebook, oh, we can't find this article in the print edition of Time. Of course you can, I said, because he's an online journalist. And what is his background? I found out what his background was. He's a freaking sports journalist. <laughs> this is what you know. He's taking up a master's in journalism at Columbia Graduate School. You know, but I've always said, it's not a matter of what school you come from, it's you. Let's talk about you, you know, because all, many of these guys, oh, I'm a, Columbia, I'm a Harvard graduate. Oh, I know someone says, oh, I went to Harvard, what, a seminar? I don't know. Anyone can pay his way to a Harvard seminar, okay? That's no big deal. Or you can buy a Harvard t-shirt, oh, hello, you know, that's easy enough. Just order on NCAA.com and you get a Harvard t-shirt, okay? It's very easy, okay? Alright, so there. Uh. <laughs> 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 All right. so, I mean, you know, but le uh, levity aside, let's talk about this human rights thing. Because the latest thing that 
the latest group which attacked Duterte was the United Nations. All right, I'm glad. Let's talk about that. Why? Because again, the narrative from the Duterte administration, if you have good stock knowledge and you understand better context of things, is this. You will right away come out strong and say, wait a minute, what is the fundamental purpose of the United Nations? Let's dig deeper. The fundamental purpose of the United Nations in 1946, it was established, why? To stop another world war from happening, period. That is the mandate of the United Nations. Very simple. That is why when it comes to North Korea, Iran, um, and Syria, for example, these things, they are very strong. They right away impose sanctions, very stringent sanctions, because it's consistent with their fundamental mandate of stopping wars and to prevent another world war. That's what the United Nations is all about. So when they talk about human rights, that dates back to 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed. Unfortunately, let me tell you right now, that's window dressing. That's not the mandate of the United Nations, because the United Nations is not supposed to interfere in internal affairs. In other words, what am I saying? Why don't, you, why don't they have signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? The interpretation of the use of human rights in various countries differs. In other words, the United Nations cannot impose its concept of human rights on individual countries. That would be interfering. And what they are doing right now is interfering, because that's not their mandate, I told you. The Declaration of Human, the Universal Declaration is window dressing, because the United Nations knows that's not their mandate. All right, they're just, you know, trying to sound nice, trying to sound lofty, whatever, but they know at the end of the day, their job is to stop world wars, or wars, period. And all of this stuff is window dressing. It's, it's cosmetics, all right? Because they know at the end of the day, they cannot impose their concept of human rights on individual countries. And so when Duterte does, does what, what he's doing right now, he has the right, based on a specific situation, based on a specific culture, to do whatever it takes to protect the broader human rights. And what are these? Look at what the drug menace has done to the Filipino. Talk about innocent victims. They talk big right now about, oh, oh, innocent victims are getting killed. Yeah, how many? How many got killed from drugs, from the drug menace? Let's talk about innocent victims. See, that's what I mean by narrative, you know? These narratives have to come out. You have to make comparative analysis to let people understand why it is necessary to do certain things and why if we don't do this, that other thing that's been happening before is worse. Because the Sinaloa cartel grew in the past six years, not now. So you have to make a distinction. You have to make a comparative analysis. That's what I mean by stealing the narrative away from the critics. You must come out strong, but intelligent and firm and convincing. Visually, audibly, and in action. When you come out, when you speak, it must be authoritative. People must believe you. When you stand up there in front of the media, you must be believed immediately. Because you have gravitas, as they say. Okay? It's all about gravitas. Okay? <laughs>